New at 7, sentencing hearing begins for man who killed a Syrian restaurant owner four years ago. Another cannabis seizure, this time at the VC Bird International Airport. Taxi operators at the VC Bird International Airport withdraw their service as they fume over threat to their livelihood. And AP Way provides fresh plan to improve water production, storage and distribution. The ABS News at 7 begins now. The local evening news is brought to you by Nagico, local agents, Bryson's Insurance. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the evening news here on ABS, Antigua's most trusted name in news. My name is Garfield Buffer. And I'm Alejandra Robinson. A special welcome to those of you joining us online via Facebook Live. <music> Well, we start off with news this evening that the latest dashboard released by the Ministry of Health shows no new laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases in Antigua and Barbuda. Now, the dashboard, which includes data as at 6 p.m. Sunday, 19th July, also shows recoveries remaining at 57 and active cases at 16. That's right, Alejandra. 939 people have now been tested in Antigua and Barbuda. 33 individuals are in government quarantine facilities, 173 in self-quarantine. The next dashboard is due on Wednesday and will contain information as at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Rest assured, we'll keep you updated on those developments as they unfold. Indeed. Well, we move on now to news from the courts. And Corey Mills, who murdered a Syrian restaurant owner four years ago, will learn his fate next week. 38-year-old Mingzem Dahir, or Dahir, was shot dead when Mills and Ian Daniel carried out a robbery at his old Palm Road restaurant April 23, 2016. Sentencing proceedings began today for Mills, who pleaded guilty to murder in November 2018. Now, the defendant told investigators Daniel suggested they rob Dahir and instructed him to shoot when the man put a put up a fight. Now, High Court Judge Justice Anne-Marie Smith will deliver written judgment in the matter next Monday. Co-accused Daniel, who pleaded guilty to manslaughter in March, is also awaiting sentencing. However, his sentencing is delayed pending a psychiatric evaluation report, which was requested by his attorney, Andrew Okola. And in more news from the courts now, because 22-year-old LaDaniel Ned has been sentenced to 12 months in prison for having sex with a 13-year-old girl. The crime was committed May last year when the defendant was 20 years old. Ned pleaded guilty to sexual intercourse with a female under the age of 14 after receiving a Goodyear indication today. Now, the judge agreed with the defense attorney, Warren Castle, who argued the case falls within the lowest level of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's sentencing guideline for the offense, category three and seriousness level B of the guideline puts the starting sentence at 5% of the maximum life sentence. Now, since a life sentence is treated as 30 years for the calculation, this brought the sentence to 18 months, which was reduced to 12 months because of the guilty plea. Now, Ned, who spent six months on remand for the offense, is expected to be released in two months, in two months time since the sentence will be further reduced by a third for good behavior. Meanwhile, in another matter in the court today, Carson Matthew Jr. will be sentenced in September after pleading guilty to assault with intent to rob today. Matthew admitted he was armed with a knife when he accosted a man on High Street in February last year. His attorney has requested a social inquiry report pending the sentencing, which is set for September 25. Well, police recently found 11 pounds of cannabis hidden in boxes of macaroni cheese at the VC Bird International Airport. The discovery was made over the weekend following a drugs operation between the Customs Department and police. The package arrived on island aboard an Amerijet flight from Miami. Police are investigating the matter. The enforcement directorate.
India has filed a fresh charge sheet against Mehul Choksi. Choksi, a diamond mogul, has been residing in Antigua since 2018, having become an Antiguan citizen under the country's Citizenship by Investment Program, or CIP. His stay on island has been shrouded in controversy as he has been accused of defrauding the Indian public-owned Punjab National Bank, a charge he has strenuously denied. A recent publication in Hindustan Times says the new charge sheet says Choksi passed off lab-grown diamonds as natural to customers through his companies. The article says the new charge sheet was filed in hopes of strengthening India's chances of having Choksi extradited to face charges there. Choksi's attorney, meanwhile, Dr. David Dorsett, declined to give a comment on the new charges when our news team contacted him today. All members of the United Taxi Association at the BC Bird International Airport were livid today about an issue affecting their livelihood. They are fuming about unlicensed operators operating as taxis. Shaolin Visa spoke with the aggrieved operators. The operators withdrew their service Monday, saying enough is enough. The members are fed up. They have guys coming here for three days and can't get a job. But there are people with A cars coming and taking up all the people for particular hotels. And that's unfair. We've been talking about this for too long, and it's time that we put a stop to that. He says a solution from the authorities has not been forthcoming. We have spoken to every authority, everybody in authority about this. And as far as we're concerned, we've been disrespected and nobody's listening to us. So we just decided that we're not going to put up with it no longer. Today, we brought the operations to a halt. Vice President Joseph Williams insists laws need to be enforced most of the time people have inside connection and other connection that gives them the right the freedom or the comfort in thinking that what they are doing that is illegal can become something acceptable and what we are simply saying it's not acceptable general secretary of the public transportation union gregory Athil, is in full support of the association and says the situation extends beyond the airport and onto the beaches at hotels. It's not only um, de decreasing the amount of work that we have, but it's also putting our country at a risk. Because these people who are coming out and seeking an airplane, they're not really practicing any social distancing, any protocols which relates to COVID. And so we might look at maybe community spread. A seaplate vehicle was blocked from picking up tourists on Monday. Every day with this young man, it is going to happen. We are going to go across the street and we're going to block him every day until this thing is settled. We are fed up of it. It has been carrying on for too long now. Sherilyn Beza reporting for AVS News. Thanks, Sherilyn. This AVS News update. Now, the national cleanup is a day behind schedule in Zone 1. Sherilyn Beza spoke exclusively with General Manager of the National Solid Waste Management Authority, the NSWMA, Darrell Spencer, about the challenges being faced. Seemingly, there is a lot more bulk waste in Antigua than we anticipated. Um, there are some communities, after we would have completed the entire community, uh, our assessment post-cleanup revealed that uh, quite a lot of the members and the villagers would have brought out more bulk waste. This general manager, National Solid Waste Management Authority, Darrell Spencer says, took two days when only one day was allocated. The initiative is now three days behind schedule. He's once again making this appeal to residents. Please put your waste out before your scheduled pickup. Uh, once they're put out afterwards, it, it, it holds us back. It, it, it does not allow us to flow freely through our scheduled activity. The NSWMA general manager urges residents to pay attention to the media houses for the dates when the team will be in their zone. Residents are reminded of the remaining zones. Zone number two, St. Philip's North and South and St. Peter's. Zone number three is St. John's Rural East. Zone number four is St. John's City South and St. John's Rural South. Zone number five is St. John's Rural West. Zone six is St. Mary's North and South. Seven is All Saints East and St. Luke and All Saints West. The St. John's City West and St. John's City East fall in Zone 8, while Barbuda is Zone Number 9. The schedule remains the same in terms of the zones, however, the start date would have changed. 
Spencer provides an update on the cleanup in Zone 1, indicating St. Peter has been completed and the team is on the final leg of St. George. On Tuesday morning at 6, the team will gather in St. John's Royal North at Cedar Grove Playing Field and work to complete the entire area in a day. Sherilyn Beza reporting for ABS News. Thanks so much, Sherilyn. Now we move on to another story here because APWA's Water Business Unit has announced plans to improve water production, storage, and distribution. The APWA has announced short, medium, and long-term plans for increase in production of potable water. That's right, Alejandro. It comes amidst a growing clamor for more of the precious commodity from residents. Joining us via Zoom to explain more on this and essentially the implications for you. When will you actually start to see an increase in your water supply? We have business unit manager at the APOA, Ian Lewis, who joins us via Zoom. Very good evening to you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good evening, Garfield. Good evening to you and your viewers. Excellent. Uh, let's start off here, Mr. Lewis. What is the current daily demand for water and how much is the APOA actually producing at this point? At this point in time, we estimate the daily demand to be somewhere in the range of about eight to eight and a half million gallons per day. And presently, we are producing just about 6.5 million gallons per day. So we're just about a million to a million and a half gallons away from the actual daily uh, demand. Okay, now, Mr. Lewis, how soon will residents start to see improvement in the water supply? Okay, APU has set about a three-stage uh, development plan, starting with a short-term goal, um, which we expect to see happening within the next uh, two to three weeks. It involves the replacement of membranes at the Ivan Rodriguez plant. We're going to be changing 336 membranes, which will increase capacity up to an additional 150,000 gallons per day. And at the Crabs desalination plant, we plan to change about 512 membranes that will see an increase of about 700,000 gallons per day. So we're looking conservatively for somewhere in the region of about 750,000 gallons to 800,000 gallons per day. Um, even with this increase in production, we will not have catch up with the demand at present. But what we're saying is that most customers will see an improved schedule where what will be available for longer periods and more people within the specified area should receive water on the days uh, that were scheduled. Uh, let's, let's talk back a little bit more about that because you've indicated a short, medium and long term strategy. I suppose what you've told us here is a short term strategy in terms of changing the membranes of the RO plants. What about the medium and long term strategies? Okay, the medium term, APR started planning probably about 18 months ago for the acquisition of two new desalination plants. One of these plants will be located at Fort James, which will have a daily production of about 500,000 gallons per day. And the other plant, a gift from the Japanese, will be located at the Fry's Beach Arrow plant, and that plant will produce about 300,000 gallons per day. Now, if it wasn't for COVID and the effect of COVID, we would have had teams in Japan and also teams in Dubai in the early part of May where these plants were being assembled and bench tested. Because of COVID, there has been a delay in the delivery of these plants and we will see them shipped at the end of August with estimated arrival time to Antigua about the end of October. Now, once those plants get on island, it'll take us an additional two months to have them up and running. So the medium term plans will see us having an increase in about 800,000 gallons per day um, by the end of the year, hopefully before the new year starts. All right, just to be now, yes. So, sorry, now, the long term, yes. The long term plans will see us building a new reverse osmosis plant within the Bethesda area at Willby Bay. And that plant is so far designed to produce about 3.2 million gallons per day. And that plant will basically do what the Potworks um, Reservoir does and the Delaps Water Treatment Plant. We notice every time that there is a shortage in surface water that the island suffers because of the lack of water coming from that particular area. So with that plant um, going to production, we've given ourselves about 
12 months. Um, that mandate was given to us by the cabinet about uh, a week ago, where they would want to see a plant up and running in about 12 months. Now, once that plant comes in line, we would have what we've always been looking for in terms of reserve production. Now, with that plant, we'll have a nameplate rating of about 11.3 million gallons of reverse osmosis water. And we expect that at those levels, we can produce about 9.5 million gallons per day, which is about 2 million gallons above what the required daily demand is. So we're saying by August next year, we should be in a very good place in terms of um, production by desalination. Now, of course, if there's surface water and groundwater, we do intend to use those resources first. But as we switch into uh, a drought period, then the desalination plants will come fully online. All right. We've been talking a lot about, uh, in terms of timeline, short, medium, long term. Uh, for residents uh, who are clamoring for water, what can you tell them in terms of days, weeks, when they will get an improvement in their supply? Well, as mentioned earlier, um, the short term, we'll see that being completed within the next two to three weeks. And once that is done, um, we will see an improvement in the schedule. We would not have caught up with the demand, but we will see an improvement in the schedule where customers will get water for a longer period of time and those areas that are scheduled, we should be able to cover 100% of those areas within the schedule time. Okay, Mr. Lewis, I know you mentioned improving the schedule, but as is, as it pertains to the schedule that now stands, have you been able to keep up with those days as it pertains to residents getting water? Um, well, it has been challenging to keep up with the schedule, apart from maintenance issues, because um, maintenance issues actually do play a major part in trying to follow the schedule with regular broken mains at this time of year when the ground is very dry. That will put the schedule off and um, it has been a bit difficult, but um, what we're saying within the next two to three weeks, we should be able to stick to the schedule that's published. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, speaking with us and giving us that update, uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. So there you have it. That's the water business manager, uh, Mr. Ian Lewis, speaking to us there about the APUA's short-term, medium-term, long-term plans. Sounds like they have a good plan going there. Looking forward to those improvements. He says as little as two to three weeks, possibly. Indeed. For the short term, and of course, uh, we'll be monitoring very closely based on the schedule that they would have at least put out in terms of yeah. the medium and long term strategies. Indeed. It's a blockbuster tonight. Our programming right here on ABS, right after the evening news, which is the most watched newscast across the Eastern Caribbean and beyond. Let's tell you about what's coming up at 8 o'clock. Take a look. Tonight on GIS Presents, we host the manager of the National Solid Waste Management Authority, Daryl Spencer, who explains in detail the frustrations and the challenges being experienced in its latest bulk waste collection campaign. That's coming up on GIS Presents at 8. And of course, right after GIS Presents, it continues. Indeed. Because coming up at 8.30, it'll be time for another edition of Monday Night Live. And host Ursul Charles Jr. and his guests discuss the topic of feminism and whether it is encroaching on men's rights. So join the conversation on all platforms, 8.30 until 10 p.m. It's television you certainly can't miss. I know this one is going to be a heated discussion tonight. What do you think, Garfield? A polarizing debate. I'll await the discussion <laughs> without giving my views on the matter. My views might perhaps uh, preempt the polarity of the discussion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stay with us for much more right here on the ABS Evening News because still to come. The Minister of the Blue Economy explains how the sargassum nuisance can be turned into a useful item. And later during news from overseas, promising news about a vaccine under development for COVID-19. We'll tell you about that momentous development which has been dominating international headlines today. When we come back on the ABS Evening News, on air and online soon. At Najico, the things that matter to you matter to us. Like your boat when you're at sea and you get away from everything. Your home and the security of your daughter's things. And the car that you've had for too long. But after all these years, you just can't let go. At Magico, we're about much more than just insurance. We're about the big things, 
and the small things that mean everything. Are you a feminist? Have we bought into the idea of moving from a patriarchal to a matriarchal society? Or is it still about equality? Zoe T and Raul Samuel join us as we look at the topic feminism, encroaching on men's rights. Join us tonight at 8.30 on Monday Night Live. As a new mom, there are moments of pride, joy, and doubt. Yes, doubt. Has he slept enough? Does she have everything that she needs? Will she be okay in the sun? These doubts come from love. For the good of baby, two servings of Nestum are full of all the goodness and naturalness of the cereals that your baby needs to blossom. That's one less thing to worry about. Nestum, it's all good, Mom. Learn more online with Nestle Baby and Me. <laughs> Join ABS for a brand new house calls, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Our guest is urologist Dr. Adrian Rod. The topic, screening for prostate cancer. House calls is unmissable, Tuesday at 8 p.m. In the field of education, and community service. Dame Idris died yesterday at the age of 91. She has been credited with influencing the lives of many people through her work in adult education and as resident tutor of the extramural department at the University of the West Indies for many years. Here's more from Andy Library. A vacation during last year's independence celebrations when the nation bestowed one of its highest honors on Dame Idris for her sterling contribution. As the nation reacts to the news of her passing, cabinet announces an official funeral will be held for Dame Idris. In paying tribute, cabinet took note of the colonial era out of which she was able to emerge and excel. It counted her among the crop of ambitious Antiguans and Barbudans who sought excellence even as the struggle ensued for regional integration and sovereignty. According to the cabinet statement, she taught and helped to shape a former prime minister, a slew of youth who fractured the past to plant new seeds and a modern future, and countless men and women who were determined to scale the hurdles which colonial Antiguan Barbuda erected to prevent excellence. She served for around 17 years as resident tutor at UE's extramural department, and it was during this time she transformed many lives through her sterling efforts in adult education. She also led pioneering work in early childhood education as the founder of the Salutha Winter Preschool, which still exists today. Arrangements for the funeral of the late Dame Idris Bird will be announced later. Andy Lieber reporting for ABS News. Of course, our condolences go out to the family. Well, as we promised you last week, ABS takes a closer look this evening at the toll on the global economy from COVID-19. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, estimates global output to contract by 5.2% this year, with developed economies expected to shrink by as much as 7%. While the global trading goods could plunge this year anywhere between 13 and 32%, and so you ask the question, what about the situation closer to home in Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, Garfield Burford has been poring over the ECLAC's latest report and joins us to break down the figures. Garfield? Thank you so much uh, again, Alejandra, and uh, thank you so much for our viewers for staying in tune with the economic numbers. We're following this because it's crucial information to keep across. Here's the situation based on the latest ECLAC report, which is actually a downgrade, a downward revision of the figures from its April numbers. And we're, very, we're following very closely and very meticulously uh, ECLAC's figures because they give the clearest indication, the clearest picture yet within our region, Latin America and the Caribbean, of the impact of COVID-19. Let's take a look at GDP performance for Latin America and the Caribbean, expected to contract by 9.1% for LAC, the entire our region. Uh, South America, if we disaggregate those figures for Latin America and the Caribbean, the South America region down by 9.4%. The 
Central America region and Mexico would be down by 8.4%. The Caribbean, uh, and this is an asterisk here because excluding Guyana, down by 7.9%. But if you put Guyana into it, Guyana's performance as the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean which will see growth this year and pretty significant growth as well actually moderates this figure. So the, the, the contraction is about 5.4% when you include Guyana outside of Guyana. 7.9%. Let's go on to our next slide because it will show uh, the kind of uh, country level based on this figure in terms of how the respective countries will be doing uh, on economic performance. Now, this shows the countries with the highest levels of economic contraction or the worst performing uh, GDP figures. Venezuela, it was having challenges even before COVID-19 and was having hyperinflation and pretty, pretty significant uh, contractions in economic activity, down by 26%. Peru will be down by 13%. Belize actually leads CARICOM with the highest level of contraction. This is the country in CARICOM with the highest level of contraction down 14% Belize. Then comes Antigua and Barbuda down 12.3% in 2020 based on ECLAC's latest forecast. St. Lucia 11.9%, St. Kitts and Nevis 11.5%. We should also indicate here in our next slide will show, as we mentioned earlier, that the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean which will see growth this year and pretty significant levels of growth is Guyana, 44.3%. But let's put a footnote there because uh, you would remember a few months ago, ECLAC's own figures indicated Guyana was expected to grow by 85.6%, of course, on its oil bounty. But this, of course, has had to be revised downward because of the impact of COVID-19, which has depressed uh, commodity prices, including oil and gas as well. Pretty significant, 44.3%. Nothing to sneeze at despite COVID-19. Let's go on to our next slide because it will show other impacts of COVID-19, not just GDP growth, not just economic output, but also in terms of GDP per capita. Now, based on ECLAC's figures, take a look at this figure here, 9.9% reduction in GDP per capita. That is uh, essentially what each person owns, what each person earns uh, from economic activity, 9.9% down. And this means that by the end of 2020, GDP per capita in Latin America and the Caribbean will be the same as in 2010. This is essentially the last decade. It means that COVID-19 has set back GDP per capita by 10 years. Significant. Very, very significant. Unemployment, let's look at another metric because it's expected to be 13.5% in 2020. That is up 5.4 percentage points, not percent, but percentage points on the 2019 figures. Pretty significant indeed. Now, Alejandro and our viewers, you might be asking, what does ECLAC uh, project or what does it recommend? What does it propose as the prescription? Uh, pun intended because we're talking about COVID-19. What does it prescribe as the uh, response by governments to what's the situation here? It is proposing that steps are taken both at the fiscal and monetary policy level to cushion the impact are the most vulnerable. One of these measures that uh, uh, ECLAC is projecting is an emergency basic income for six months for the entire population living in poverty in 2020, while another is support for businesses and jobs at risk. Certainly, the measures required will take a strong fiscal response, and it comes at a time when governments are facing challenges in healthcare expenditure and declining revenues. There are absolutely, Alejandra, no easy options. And when you consider the fact that governments in this region do not have the option of quantitative easing, which is essentially printing money and buying up bonds, it makes it extraordinarily difficult and presents some significant challenges. Back over to you, Alejandra. Very frightening figures there. And I think you kind of uh, put it into context there for us a while ago when you said COVID-19 has set us back 10 years. Certainly in relation to GDP per capita, which was on an upward trajectory, certainly in Antigua and Barbuda and across other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, now set back by 10 years because of within what has happened within the last six months. Mm. Let's hope that the next six months will be a lot better. We won't see a repeat of the last six months or else we'll really and truly be in trouble then. Indeed. Right. Thanks, Garfield. I know you'll continue to watch those figures for us and continue to update us. Well, we move on here now with another story. The University of the West Indies Center for Resource Management and Environment Studies says Antigua will continue to be inundated with sargassum seaweed until mid-September. It's a nuisance for many, but Minister for Social Transformation and the Blue Economy, Dean Jonas, sees it as a potentially valuable resource. It's a very good source of um, fertilizer for crop farming. And we need that in Antigua because in Antigua, the soil in certain places are not that good. 
and this will help to greatly improve on the quality of soil in, in many farming areas. Well, he says there are other possible uses for the seaweed. You can get machines out of China that can help to convert this orgasm, like I said, into paper products for cardboard, for boxes and packaging and bags and that sort of thing. We're going the minister says Antiguans who are able to harness the uses of the seaweed and meet local demand may be eligible for government protection. Well, this means government may halt the importation of similar products to bolster local businesses. This, he says, was previously done for egg producers across the country. Finally, in our national segment, there needs to be a move away from hunting for fish. So says the Honorable Dean Jonas, Minister for Social Transformation and the Blue Economy. He says aquaponics will be a major focus of his ministry. It doesn't interfere with what the existing farmers are doing. But I think it's probably a more efficient way for persons to farm because you get both fish as well as plants in aquaponics. And so we basically are going to be looking at what opportunities may exist for in that particular sector. Minister Jonas says the onset of COVID-19 has brought opportunities for entry into this and other markets. I think aquaponics presents tremendous opportunities for persons who are in the hotel industry and others who are laid off, unemployed persons. And so this is one of the key areas that we're going to be looking at to transition persons into that as a business to get them to understand that they are tremendous opportunities there. He says there will be incentives for interested people as it, is, as it is impossible for current organic farmers to meet all the local demand. The minister adds the last market study indicated imports of tilapia amounted to more than 2 million US dollars. A pretty significant figure there, Alejandro, Indeed. as we bring an end to our local segment, a packed national segment. Mm -hmm. Plus, we should tell our viewers we're keeping, uh, we're following very closely the developments in relation to LIA, a shareholders meeting being held today. It should have been started at five o'clock. We're monitoring that very closely. As news emerges from that, rest assured, the nation's news authority will give you that as it unfolds. Indeed, indeed. Well, time now for us to take a commercial break, but you want to stay with us because coming up after the break, we have news from overseas. And the Bahamas on the verge of barring travelers from the United States as it responds to an increase in COVID-19 cases. And for other field, we told you about that story earlier. Vaccine developed against the coronavirus shows significant promise. That story upcoming on the ABS Evening News on air and online. Do stay with us.